Technological advancement here in Britain as everywhere else depends on the ability to comprehend the nature... Um, no, change that. Comprehend, Miss Williams. Mm. Make it understand. Plain English is best. Yes, sir. <laughs> to, um, to understand the nature of the objective. Simply to achieve it is not enough. Nearly 30 years' experience of business and public life has taught me that success is relative to the manner of succeeding. With the man dictating this speech, to be made to an international business conference, has succeeded very well. He is Charles Hayden, giant of the business world. What is more, he lives by his principles. He is in every sense a gentleman, respected by his friends, his business associates, and the public for his judgment and humanity. It's sad to think that before the day is out, he will be dead. And if we are to continue to live in this world, a doubtful likelihood, we must contrive to respect it as it, for all our abuse and foolishness, has respected us. Yes, I think that will do, Miss Williams. It'll do very well, sir. Oh, thank you. This is your Bristol speech. Yes. Uh, have you found a room for me anywhere? Yes, sir. The Avon Gorge Hotel. Fine. Well, there's your speech at the Bank of England dinner on Tuesday. We'll do that when I get back on Monday. Mr. Hayden's office. Hello, Miss Williams. It's Mrs. Hayden. Is my husband there? Oh, yes, of course, Mrs. Hayden. It's your wife, sir. Oh, thanks. Hello, Iris, my dear. I've just got in. You wanted me to ring? Uh, yes. Um, a slight change of plan, I'm afraid. I'm going down to Bristol now instead of tomorrow evening. The man from our Canberra office wants to have a word about something. The place will be full of delegates from all over the world anyway. I'd like to get to know them. I see. Well, we were having drinks at the Jefferson's this evening. Yes, but I know. But this is all good for business, I suppose. Well, well I'll make the usual apologies. Uh, thank you, my dear. You should find quite a few old friends in Bristol, too. Very probably. Well, don't get drunk, Charles. No, dear. What about your things? Well, I've got a spare case in the car. It's only for a couple of nights. I'll be back straight after the speech on Saturday afternoon. Well, look after yourself, dear. And you, Iris. God bless. Charles drove himself whenever he could. His chauffeur had more time off than on. Unlike a lot of us, Charles enjoyed the solitude. It gave him time to think. He was a good driver, too. The motorway to Bristol from London, the M4, is fast and goes through some pleasant stretches of countryside. A summer evening, and still light. Not much traffic about. Charles was well past Reading into Wiltshire when a signboard announcing a turning off a mile ahead caught his eye. The turning off to a place called Wentworth. Wentworth? Good heavens! Almost without knowing it, he turned off and slowed down. A few hundred yards ahead, a patrolman had pulled into the side. Um, excuse me. Sir? How far is Wentworth from here? Oh, about four miles, sir. Hmm. There was a village just beyond it, uh, Mickleham. Is it, uh, <laughs> is it still there? Oh, yes, sir. Not a housing estate by now or anything? No, sir. <laughs> and the inn, the Royal Oak? Oh, yes, that's still there, sir. Just the same. I can't believe it. Well, you take the first turning right past Wentworth, and then if you keep on... Y going... Yes, 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 I, I know the way from there. <laughs> Thanks. Good night. Night, sir. Mifflin. It was 32 years ago that he first set eyes on it. During the war, he was stationed near there. And 27 years since he left it behind. And Ruth. Never mind, Micklem was still there. And the Royal Oak. Only 20 minutes out of his way. I could just have a look at it. Go in for a few minutes, perhaps. Taste that local beer again. And that room on the first floor, number seven. How's it looking now, I wonder? They might even let me go up and see. Why not? Why not? A light rain was falling. After the hot, dry spell, the roads were greasy. He was glad to be off the motorway and along the country lanes. His impatience to get to the inn urged him on, faster and faster.
Charles opened the ancient latched door of the Royal Oak and made his way to the lobby. Once there, he paused in amazement. It was quite unchanged from what he knew 30 years ago. Perhaps the wallpaper was less insipid, but the cream paintwork, the furniture and its very disposition, the smell of food from the kitchen, even the temperature and the snug atmosphere were precisely as he remembered them. The sound of a television set in the lounge was the only unfamiliar feature. He glanced up the stairs and saw that the tall bronze of the winged Apollo bearing a lamp, the same lamp in his upraised hand, was still in its place, still lighting inadequately the draughty corridor on the first floor. There was no one to be seen anywhere. The reception desk was deserted. Anyone about? Well, that's odd. Behind the desk was the office. It was empty. He rang the little brass bell that he had rung so often. But no one came. It's extraordinary. extraordinary. Mrs. Bailey? Mrs. Bailey? He remembered that Mrs. Bailey, who owned the inn in those days, was well into her sixties then. She would have parted from it long ago, if not from life itself. There must be someone in somewhere. He went to the bar and looked in. A huddle of elderly men at a table in the far corner murmured over their beer, taking no notice of him. And there was no one behind the counter. In the lounge, the only occupant was fast asleep in an armchair. Charles went back to the reception desk. The keys of vacant rooms hung on a board, and that to number seven was among them. No other key was of interest to him. It was as much his room now as it was all those years ago. He took the key and climbed the dim stairs, remembering accurately which of them would creak under his foot. On reaching the door, such a fierce gust of emotion seized him that for a moment he lost his balance and almost turned away, too much aware of the explosion of memory that would follow his going in. But he knew that he must and would go in. His hand went straight to the switch and the light that came on was as bright in that same yellow lampshade as it had ever been. The wardrobe, the painted towel horse, the rubbish bin, and the rugs on the polished floor were as he had left them. He sat on the old, sumptuous double bed and contemplated the familiar design of its brass ornamentation. Titles of books he had read in this room ran through his mind. The shape of shadows on the ceiling revived his attitudes his very thoughts at that time. And hard as it was to believe. <laughs> that tap is still dripping. <laughs> He'd come back here after the Anzio landing, after Cherbourg, on sick leave after he was wounded at Cologne. He was in this room when Germany capitulated. <sighs> I slipped off the celebrations on this bed. He got up and went to the window. The fading sunlight and a gentle rain fell across the fields and hedgerows. Apart from new outbuildings on a distant farm, the landscape was unchanged. And the small wooden bridge over the stream that he had crossed so you often was... You got my message, Charles. The voice was in the room, behind him. Ruth's voice. He dared not turn at once. Indeed, he could not. For he was momentarily rigid, fixed by a kind of dread of disappointment, if he should find that it was his imagination playing tricks... And not Ruth, who had spoken. He was ice cold all over. At last he turned. Ruth! She was at the door in a loosely tied housecoat. It flashed through Charles's mind that she must be fifty now. Yet she seemed far younger and was quite as attractive as the girl he had once known and could not forget. She had that same subdued vitality, the same constantly amused eyes. <laughs> You're here. Yes. It, it can't be true. Yes. True. Take my hand. Oh. Prove it. <laughs> you. Here. Oh. In room number four. <laughs> and you're in seven. As we always were. <laughs> As we always were. Mm. Our gesture to respectability. Well, I preferred the view from here. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Ruth. Oh, darling Ruth. Oh, Charles. I, I still can't believe it. When did you arrive? A little while ago. But why? Because you were coming. 
But I wasn't. I'm on my way to Bristol. Yes, a conference or something. It said so in the papers. Not that I was coming here. I didn't know myself until half an hour ago. How did you? I hoped you would. I guessed. Guessed? I could always read your mind. Yes, yes, you could. <laughs> Only too well. As soon as we first met, Captain Hayden. That dance <laughs> in the village hall. The Paul Jones. <laughs> Entertaining the troops. I hadn't wanted to go at all. Just suppose there hadn't been a Paul Jones. Suppose you hadn't happened to fetch up opposite me. We shouldn't be here now. We'd never have known this room. Oh. Our headquarters. Eh? <laughs> Every leave I could manage. It kept me alive. The headquarters of our love affair. <laughs> oh, 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 darling. What message? Hmm? Just now. You said you got my message. What message? Oh. Now, come on. Well, you were in your car on the M4 to Bristol, weren't you? Yes. You saw Wentworth signposted and you turned off. Yes. Because you thought of me. Yes. There you are then. That was my message. Hmm. It's busy along the lane this evening. It was always so quiet before. What's going on? Charles. Hmm? Here. Lie beside me. <laughs> there never was anywhere to sit in this room. <laughs> Please. Oh, I, I still can't believe it. Oh, the years, the years I've waited for this. Yes. <laughs> you went ahead and married Iris, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, we had our 27th wedding anniversary the other day. Congratulations. Thanks. It turned out to be everything you wanted, then. Everything you hoped for. Yes. Oh. Uh, don't turn away, my love. Ruth. Have you a cigarette? Mm, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. You married pretty well yourself. I thought so. How did you know? I saw the announcement in the Times. A doctor? A surgeon. Yes. You lived in Whitney? Yes. Robert worked at a hospital in Oxford. Hold my hand, darling. I, um, I called at your house one day. When? Well, it must have been, well, 12 years ago. We took a cottage for the summer. The Cotswolds and all that. About eight miles from you, I walked over. By yourself? Yes. Iris was never too fond of walking. <laughs> we had some gorgeous walks here. We did. I remember. Yes, of course I do. Why did you call at the house? Oh, I found myself in Whitney and I thought, why not? Is that true? No, I planned it. I couldn't resist the chance of seeing you. <laughs> Was that wise? Perhaps not. But I told myself that either your husband knew nothing about us, or if he did, he'd hardly see any harm in a casual visit so many years afterwards. I mean, you didn't even know him when we were... when we broke up. No. You really thought Robert wouldn't have minded? Yes. It really is surprising how logical and civilised we expect other people to be <laughs> on such occasions. <laughs> was anyone in? Your husband was. What happened? He said you were out and wouldn't be back for some time. He asked me in, though, and gave me a drink. A nice chap, I thought. Yes, he was with strangers. Then what? We talked. After a while, of course, he told me you'd gone. Left him. He said that? Yes. Why, hadn't you? Yes, I had. Two years before. Hello, sounds as if they're all coming back. There was no one about when I arrived. I must just see... Charles! No, only a second. Oh, yes. The entire staff, it looks. Even the chef and the guests. Where on earth have they been? It's extraordinary. Draw the curtains, darling. <laughs> Remember the trouble we had with moths? Heavens, yes. Hundreds of them all over the roof. <laughs> yes. And you knew all the names. Oh, well, I were a local girl. I learned them at school. Nature study. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I must go down to the desk. Why? Well, let them know I'm here. No, no, not yet. I must. No, please. Lie down again. Hey. You know, I've just thought of something. Mm. I, I could stay here for the night and go first thing. We'll have dinner at our table. <sighs> Between the fireplace and the grandfather clock. That's the one. Let's have a bottle of champagne. The last time was V.E. night. What a night. <laughs> Three pounds the bottle. I seem to have no money in those days. It didn't matter. No. Remember Daisy? The waitress. Yes. 
She loved the postman. Poor Daisy. Uh, why? He married someone else. About the time you went away. For good, I mean. She was so sweet to me. I hope I was sweet to her. There's one thing I must do. Ring that Bristol hotel. Oh, no, Charles. No, take a moment. Put it down, Charles, please. Why? There's plenty of time. But... I want to talk. That's all. <laughs> you always won. Well, always but once. Take my hand again. Darling. At times you looked at me like that. Like a sculptor studying his subject. You said that before. I said everything before. You still look so young. How have you done it? <laughs> Come, lie down. Oh. <laughs> Same old bed. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Same old strings, eh? <laughs> You know, I, I thought this was all past. Worse than that, I thought we were past it. We're middle-aged now. It doesn't seem to matter. No, it doesn't. I've lost some of my hair, I'm afraid. I'm not as slim as I was. No, nor am I. But you are. <laughs> Too late, darling. Sorry. <laughs> it makes no difference anyway. No. None at all. Oh, Ruth, I love you. I love you. Oh. oh. Who'd have believed we'd be lying here together again? This room, this bed. Mm. I want you as much as ever. Me too. Why did you leave Robert? Have you been happy with Iris? Have you? been a successful marriage? I said happy. Not entirely happy, but successful. Meaning it allowed you to be successful? I suppose so, yes. You'd have been happy with me. Uh, let's not talk about it. Not so successful, perhaps, but uh, happier. Ruth, Ruth, please. I want to talk no. about it. Come with me now. Hmm? Come with me. Where? How do you mean? Come with me. Let's be together all the time. Oh, Ruth, how can it's I? It's easy. It certainly isn't. Yes, it's easy now. Just come. I can't. Why not? Why not? Are you afraid of a scandal? Of a row in the boardroom? None of these things. They won't happen anyway. Well, they could? No. How do you know? They won't. If that's all it's you... It's not. I've told you. It's none of those things. What then? You know perfectly well. I... Oh, Ruth. Ruth, don't. Leave me alone. Oh, darling. Don't stare down at me like that. You, you look like a... Like a judge about to pass sentence. Iris, aren't there any limits to that sort of loyalty? She's my wife. I knew you long before she did. Yes, but... But? But her father was a top civil servant at the war office. He could pull strings. Oh, Ruth. Just what an ambitious young man was looking for. You don't have to remind me. People manage to forget such things. Well, how could I? I see his daughter every morning across the breakfast table. Well, it paid off. If it's any comfort to you, it's the one thing in my life that I most regret, that I'm most ashamed of. It's no comfort. <sighs> well, you told me all about it in this room that evening. I know. Just before you were demobbed. Yes. She's an unremarkable girl, you said. Did I? God forgive me. Wasn't she? I suppose, <laughs> yes. But I was fond of her. You loved me. I can smell boiled fish. Let's go down and eat. Shall we? Ruth? Don't you owe me some loyalty, too? Yes, yes, I do. Not because I... I knew you first, or because it would be decent of you, or anything of that kind, but just naturally, because you love me more than anyone. Don't you? Yes, I do. Forget Iris, then. Stay with me. Oh, darling. We had this conversation once before. That evening? Yes. It wasn't a conversation. It was an almighty row. It was the worst battle I fought in the whole war. <laughs> <laughs> it got us nowhere then. Now, now, don't start again. Hmm? I'm more your wife than she'll ever be. Yes. You said that at the time. I could still be. I could go on being. I could, Charles. No. Well, why do you smile? Why do you shake your head? You know. You could come with me. 
There's nothing to stop you. <laughs> Drew, my darling. You never did accept anything without a fight, did you? <laughs> well, what fights we had. And what armistices. Oh, that was the great thing. The armistice, even that evening. <laughs> yes. Oh, come here. Hmm? Oh. <laughs> oh, my darling. <laughs> now we're together <laughs> again. <laughs> Let's simply enjoy it. Forget what happened. We yes. can't change it. It's, it's now that matters. Yes. Yes, it is. Now. You know what? I don't have to go tomorrow. I can take another day. My speech isn't until Saturday. We'll do all those walks we used to do. Hmm? We'll lunch at the pub if, if it's still there. Uh, and we could go No. To... Why not? Not just a day. Not even two or three days. Or a year. For good. Or not at all. Well, that, that's impossible. It's not. It isn't, Charles. Oh, listen... People arriving, they might want this room. I must go down. No, don't. Uh, darling, if I'm staying... You needn't. You needn't stay? Come with me. With... You... Oh, you mean, you mean your room, but it's so small, so's the bed. I it? don't mean my room. Well, then. Ruth, what do you mean? Listen to me. Listen. I want you to leave Iris of your own free will. What? I want you to choose between us, here and now. What? What, what is this? What are you up to? It's your last chance. Come with me now, if you want to. Or not at all. Ruth, I I'm not free to choose. Suppose you were. Would it be Iris or me? Uh, uh, Iris, it has to be. <gasps> oh, Ruth, you're not really going. Uh, Ruth! When Robert told you I'd left him, did he say how? How? What do you mean? When a woman can't stand the man she has and can't have the man she wants, what's the best way to leave? Ruth? Goodbye. Charles stared at the door for some moments, unable to move. His entire body was cold, paralyzed by the inadmissible. Was Ruth then some sort of apparition? Or the manifestation of his associations with this room and his desires? An hallucination? It couldn't be so. She was as much alive as he. It was just like her to use such extreme and desperate means to get her own way. I'm damned if I'll let her. He knew he could talk her round in time and get his way. He always had in the past. She'll still be in her room, putting her things together. He got off the bed to go to her. But at that moment, there were voices outside the door. Oh, she's in the door. Would you believe it? Oh, and the lights on. These blessed maids. It was the proprietress of the inn with two guests, an elderly couple. They took no notice of Charles. Excuse me. Anyway, this is the room. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll find it comfortable. Oh, yes, it's very nice. Yes, splendid. Still, they ignored Charles. He might not have been in the room. I'm awfully sorry, but... Such a uh, charming room. Oh, we'll take you. it, shall we, Edward? Uh, by all means, my dear. Look, I'm sorry, but it's taken. There's you see... a splendid view from here. Ah. You can see for miles. Listen, I'm in here. Oh, look, Edward, nothing but fields. A stream as well. Uh, can I fish there? Oh, certainly. Uh, excuse me, I take it you're the proprietress. There was no one about, you see, when I got here. And, What's uh, all that going on along the lane there? Oh, yes, yes, a dreadful. We heard the crash from here. Everybody rushed to help it. Oh, it was terrible. Will you please leave this room at once? He must have hit that tree at a terrific oh, speed. Dear. They tried to get him out, but it was no use. Charles would not listen to any more. He wanted to find Ruth. But the distance to the door seemed endless. And his legs refused to move. Poor fellow. Yes, he must have died instantly. Oh, chap called Hayden, Charles Hayden. He's been on television. I recognised him. But, oh, it gave me an awful turn. Charles, almost dragging himself along, escaped from the room and hurried as best he could down the passage, praying that Ruth had not yet left her room. Reaching it, he saw that the number four had been erased. The door was unlocked. He opened it. It was no longer a room, but a large store cupboard. Ruth! Ruth! 
Charles searched the hotel, but she was nowhere to be found. Ruth! Not in the lounge or the bar or the dining room. Nowhere. Ruth! He ran outside and along the lane. Ruth! Ruth! But only the wind answered him. Only the wind and the noise of a breakdown lorry hauling his car out of the ditch. 